Welcome to A Wee Bit of War, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Northern Ireland during the Second World War. I'm your host, Scott Edgar, and in this episode, we're joined by the incredibly knowledgeable Sam Robinson. Sam is a historian and a devoted fan of Glentoran Football Club in East Belfast. The club has strong connections to the Second World War, and we'll take a deep dive into some of them now. Sam, welcome to the podcast. We are delighted to finally have you join us. Thank you, Scott. No, it's, a, it's, it's an absolute honour and a privilege. It's uh, something I've been looking forward to doing. Uh, many of our listeners come from far and wide outside of East Belfast. So for those who don't know you and your work, can you give us a little bit of an introduction? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, as I say, my name's Sam Robinson. I am a, I suppose, a fourth generation uh, supporter of Glenthorne Football Club. Uh a club raised in the heart of East Belfast in 1882. Uh, my family's sort of love for the club goes back almost to the time of Titanic. Uh, on actually on both sides of my family. So, so first and foremost, as I say, I'm, I suppose would you say a fanatical supporter? Yes, I, I probably am. Uh, but I've also a huge interest in, in local history, and uh, and that in turn has stemmed a real interest in the history and the heritage of Glen Thorne Football Club, uh, something that I've delved into probably over the past 20, 25 years. Now, officially, uh, Irish League football ceased for the duration of the Second World War, but things like Glen Thorne continued to play. What, what was the football scene like in the early 1940s in Ulster? Well, well, it was it was certainly a toned down, regionalized ver- variation of of what people had seen before. You know, it, it's actually incredible that football continued to be played, uh, but but in, in some instances, some of the teams were supplemented by soldiers who were who were who were based in in Northern Ireland at the time, and uh, and that in itself, you know, <laughs> almost almost lifted the standard and. Uh, there were very few, very few sort of things of interest to, to occupy people and take their mind off what was going on, you know, both 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 in, in Britain and in mainland Europe. So football became you, 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 the the thing to sort of go and do and see, uh, and and the support in, in reality never waned all throughout the war. You know, from from Glen Thorne's perspective, uh, we we then became handicapped with events that we'll go on to discuss as 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 we move along. But but certainly, you know, the the, the, the football was regionalized, teams played each other more locally than they had done. But uh, but the standard and the support uh, remained pretty much pretty much the same. Now I am what they call a blow in to East Belfast and uh, I grew <laughs> up supporting Portadown football club. You're obviously a yeah. Glen Torren fan and and we've said that's uh that's a club steeped in history. I just talked over you there as you were going to make some sort of apology for me. <laughs> that's I've done this before, yeah. Um, <laughs> we have this uh, this episode. It's going out uh, on the 26th of April. Um, that's a couple of days before the 80th anniversary of an event that rocked the Glen Torren team. Uh, can you tell us that story, Sam? And let's, let's just start with who was Big Tom Pearson? Okay, well, well, to take you back to Tom Pearson, Tom Pearson's story really starts in 1936 when he arrives in East Belfast. Uh, Glen Thorne had been going through a poor run of form, if you like, and had brought a, an English manager by the name of Sam Jennings to the Oval. Uh, Jennings had managed clubs like Marseille, for example, and, and, and came and, and decided that what was needed was a root and branch sort of uh, demolition of the club and a rebuild, and and to do this, he got several players from the mainland. One of which was a strapping six foot two goalkeeper by the name of Tom Pearson, who had played at Derby and Leeds. And and within a short time, Pearson, because of his actual look, he he, he was quite a charismatic and and adding adding magic figure. But he became a, a firm favourite of the uh, of the Glen Thorne faithful. Uh, so, so Tom played all through the seasons right up until the war, the outbreak of war, and and met and married a local girl by the name of Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth Duff, and uh, and and they lived at uh, they lived at Parkgate, and Parkgate 
uh, district of East Belfast. So, so Tom in reality could have probably stayed and played football, but he but he felt compelled to enlist. And uh, and at the outbreak of war, he joined the Irish Guards and uh, went off went off to train. Uh, uh, I think initially in Scotland, he. Uh, as I say, he was idolised by the local supporters. One of which was a was a gentleman by the name of Eddie Don, Donnan, who was a who was a teenager who who he just loved Pearson. And in two thousand and nine, we actually interviewed Eddie, and and Eddie, as it turned out, enlisted in the Irish Guards as well, and found himself in the same platoon as uh, as as Tom Pearson. So, so the two, uh, the, the Irish Guards were deployed to Northern Africa, and the two found themselves uh, pretty, pretty much fighting shoulder to shoulder uh, and at the start of March 1943. Pearson, Pearson had, uh, he, he found himself trapped on a ridge called Raggy Ridge in, in Tunisia, uh, this outcrop. And in order to get his, his unit off the ridge, he loaded. He loaded tracer rounds into a brain gun and pretty much stood and and attacked the the, the, the Germans uh, whilst whilst his whole unit got off the got off the ridge. And for that, Tom Pearson was awarded the military medal and was due to receive it uh, in Tunis from the king in, in June. Uh, Eddie, Eddie tells us that uh, this this pretty much created a bit of a a lust for more kills, if you like, as, as regards Pearson. And in every patrol that they went out, he went out of his way to try and capture Germans. And uh, and in one particular instance, had come across a German uh, a half track, uh, a German personnel carrier, which which he tried the attempt to to take prisoner by putting a string of mines across the road. But as they were putting the mines out. Uh, Eddie tells the story that the uh, the turret opened. A German officer appeared in the turret with a machine gun, and actually shot Pearson uh, in front of him. So it's a it's a bizarre thing that the, the you know Eddie watched his hero being gunned down in front of him, and all those years later, just remembered it as clear as day. The shock uh, of, of of watching the game torn goalkeeper die in front of him, and so Pearson was never actually awarded his military medal. Uh, that was that was presented to his wife, and it's only in the last few years that this the story has come to light. We've worked really closely with the Irish Guards uh, and and their museum, and uh, and at the start of at the start of last season, the Irish Guards actually presented the club with a replica of Pearson's military medal, which now takes pride of place in the uh, in the boardroom at the Oval. So. So Pearson's story is pretty much typical of many, many local lads who sort of went away to, to fight in the war. And uh, with 98 games, I believe, played for the Glens, like you said, Pearson was well loved on the terraces uh, of the Oval. That's Glen Torrance home in East Belfast. And in, in 2021, uh, working along with uh, the Irish Guards there, the club decided to erect this permanent memorial to the Guardsmen. Uh, how did that How did that come about? Well, when we actually delved into Pearson's record, it was fairly extensive. So we had his military records and his uh, his actual recruitment papers and whatever. Uh, and, and, and mindful of the connection, uh, the, the, the club wanted to, to create some sort of permanent memorial. So all his records are framed, and and they're positioned at the director's entrance at the main stand at the Oval. So so if the club are at home, uh, for example, uh, you, you know over over the remembrance weekend, they they'll hold a ceremony at the Pearson Memorial, and uh, and anybody visiting the club are, are more than welcome to call in, and uh, and have a read through his records and whatever. You know it's it's a really it's a really interesting read and a real tragic story, as I say, that, you know, he wasn't, he, he, he didn't even get to get the medal that, uh, that he, he, he so richly deserved. And that, you know, that, that permanent memorial there, we said, unveiled in, in 2021. But Sam, from 2021 
let's go back another 80 years. So we're talking now 1941, almost two full years before the tragic death of Tom Pearson. Uh, the 4th to the 5th of May 1941 was a devastating night in East Belfast and the beginning of dark days for Glentorn Football Club. Uh, if listeners don't know the geography of East Belfast, it's worth looking up the oval on a map. Uh, the football ground lies within a stone's throw of the Harland Wolf shipyard, Short and Harland Aircraft Factory and the former RAF Sydenham, now George Best City Airport. And those two former premises in particular were key targets for the Luftwaffe in 1941, and the Oval would pay the price. Uh, Sam, can you take us through a little of what became known as the fire raid? Yes. Uh, to, to talk about the fire raid, we probably need to go back to November 1940. And, uh, and in, in later years, the discovery of Luftwaffe reconnaissance photographs, which are now in the uh, Imperial War Museum, uh, and in November 1940, a single reconnaissance plane over the city of Belfast highlighted targets, obviously uh, designated to be to be struck uh, in, in the spring moons the following during the spring moons of the following uh, the following year. And um, when we actually got access to the uh, the reconnaissance photograph, it became apparent that. Uh, there, there was an old myth amongst supporters and families. My family were from Solway Street, uh, right beside the ground. But there was always a myth that the Germans on the night of the fire raid had jettisoned their bombs, which which had struck the football ground. But in actuality, uh, when 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 we get to see the reconnaissance photographs, the oval is actually designated as target A, and it delineated as what what was known as tanksum lagging and Conswater. Which, which translates to an oil storage facility. And, and the reason we believe that the Germans thought that the, the Oval was an oil storage facility was because of the shape of the ground. The Oval does exactly what it says on the tin, uh, you know, on the tin and, and from a height of 30 odd thousand feet, looks like it is part of either, either the shipyard the oil storage tanks, uh, which, which if you if you know the later the the area used to be across the Sydney bypass, uh, or or in, or indeed the shipyard. So the, the the oval was designated as target A for the second series of raids, uh, which were undertaken on on the the fourth and fifth of May, uh, nineteen forty one. Uh, originally, the ground had been built in that ship because it was it was hoped that it would be used as a velodrome. So if you can imagine the shape of a velodrome, and uh, and as I say, that that meant that this was the first first target bombed on that night. Uh, anecdotally, older supporters who were there at the time say that uh, the Luftwaffe created a perfect bombing run across the pitch with one bomb landing on the, on the corner flag at the Sydney Bypass end one bomb landing in the center circle and the third bomb landing at the other corner flag which not only decimated the club pavilion but also mercy street uh, primary school which which sits adjacent to the ground itself so uh so yeah the, 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 the club had also been a hub in 1940 uh, during during the summer had been used to actually train local men in their hundreds uh to to pretty much defend with their bare hands uh, their their property and their families uh, the uh, the training was undertaken at the oval during the summer by uh, by the Ulster Gymnastic Association and there's some incredible pictures of of local men after work five abreast on the track around the oval doing calisthenics and and unarmed combat so. Uh, so yes, the, the 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 ground was the ground was all but destroyed uh, in that raid in, in May nineteen forty one. And um, I'd I'd actually forgotten about those photographs. Um, that that training in through sort of nineteen forty um, would that have been for the Ulster Home Guard or the local defence no, volunteers? It, it, it was from from the reports I think that we had in the newspaper. It was it was just it was just. 
pretty much for local men. Uh, I, I don't know if they then formed into the, the, the home guard or whatever, but I think that was a nice thing that's, you know, if, <laughs> you know, if, if Northern Ireland's invaded, there's there's a likelihood that you will have to defend yourself, you know. And uh, it's not like the modern times. The photographs are incredible. You 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 know they're all men with their shirt sleeves rolled up and you know their suit trousers and sunny nights at the Oval, you know. So so as regards the war, that the, the stadium itself was being used as a hub, you know, long before the bombings. And then of course, uh, it's it's the location of the. Uh, of the observation post on the top of Sydenham Hill as well, so so it was it was playing a part in in the war effort, you know, long before it was born. born. And uh, we'll we'll come back to that observation post a bit later. But um, in terms of damage done to the city, this uh, fire raid, as it became known, was the most severe attack on Belfast during the Blitz. What was the impact? What were the effects felt by Glentoran Football Club? Glenthorne were, as a football club and an entity, Glenthorne were completely decimated, almost almost sort of wiped out, if you like. Uh, the pavilion was of wooden construction. Uh, and obviously, because of the fire raids, it, it, it burnt to the ground. And, and Glenthorne, in reality, lost all their club records, all their photographs. Uh, all of their trophies, with the exception of, of, of one quite significant one, uh, and and even the club kept. So all the playing strip that was held at the pavilion was destroyed, which which meant that those those charged with the uh, with the running of the club were were forced to make a, a very very difficult decision as to you know what what to do and and. We never, we never had any photographs of, of the destruction. There are, there are numerous, as you well know, numerous incredible photographs of Belfast and the effects of the Blitz. But uh, we only discovered within the past two years uh, a series of photographs which show the Oval in the aftermath of the bombing. And the destruction is, is absolutely incredible. If you know the area, you'll know that the stadium sits beside the Conswater River. It's also six feet below sea level and it, it, it sits on a fluvial flood plain as well. So so the instant that was bombed and everything was breached, uh, the ground flooded beyond belief. Uh, my own mother used to tell a story about she was a pupil of, of, of Mercy Street Primary School. And she would tell the story that after school they would climb through one of the walls into the stadium, and and her and my uncle, and and, and some of the other children would navigate the flooded oval in tin bars playing parrots and, and things like that, you know. So, so that was the extent of the destruction of the stadium. Everything was gone, and as I say, it was up to five men to make the decision as to whether the club folded there and then. Uh, or, or or continued. Uh, that decision was taken in July of that year in the uh, in the YMCA building on the Albert Bridge Road, and uh, only a casting vote of the chairman, a gentleman by the name of Toby Mercer, uh, meant that the club would would just decide to rebuild and, and and start the long the long haul back, which which in reality I suppose took almost eight years. It's not a quick fix to uh, repair bomb damage to a football ground. I, uh, you know, I've added myself as a Ported Iron fan, so I may as well go the the whole way and say I'm also a fan of Manchester United, uh, who were forced oh, to play their uh, games at their rivals' main road ground in the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, what happened to the Glens? Did they move? Did football continue? How did they go about that eight-year period of rebuilding the club? Yeah, it was actually, you know, it, it showed it showed great goodwill from from other football, other football clubs in the city. Uh, first and foremost, Glenthorne were offered the use of Grosvenor Park, the home of the Stillery, uh, in, in the west of the city. So, so that secured that secured a, uh, a, a a venue for them to play their games. Uh, the Stillery also lent the club 
playing shirts uh, as dead crusaders. And, and you know, loads as I am to mention it also, Lin Linfield actually uh, donated, you know, made a financial donation to the club too, which, which in the grand scheme of sporting things, uh, you know, is, is never forgotten by the club either. So, so yeah, you know, the rivalries kind of went out the window. Uh, so within a short period of time, uh, Toby Mercer having decided to uh, to continue playing football, uh, you know, team, teams rallied around, and and Glen Torn were at least able to field uh, teams. But the hard work really took place away from the football field. Uh, committees were set up. Uh, architects were appointed and and for the first two or three years because of the location of the ground which was always on reclaimed land uh the the actually pumping of the of of the the the, the water away was 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 almost just continual as quickly as it was as it was pumped away it was running back into the, into the ground which which was a constant frustration uh but but money was raised, and about three or four years ago, I uh, had the opportunity to, in to interview a man called George Mooney, who had been a uh, been a pupil of Mercy Street School, and and George told me two lovely stories. One one of which was of his mother. He, he said he came he come home from school one day, uh, and his mother was furious. She she was in a real foul mood. And uh, as it turns out, she had discovered that uh, that <laughs> her husband had been using their clothing coupons from the war effort, the war rations that they were given. He had actually donated the clothing coupons to Glen Thorne Football Club to allow them to buy a new kit, which which left her and the children with actually no nothing in the ration book for her, for, for them. And he said she was making soda farls at the time. And he says, I recollect her throwing the soda farls at my father and him being covered in flour and being thrown out. I think he was out of the house for about three or four days before she let him back in, you know. And, and, and I don't think he was the only one that was actually doing that. You know, people were doing really mad things. And, uh, and George maintained that after school finished, he would come out of the school and there would be a single man standing uh, building the bricks, which now form the the facie of the ground, if you like, at the turnstiles. Uh, and and this gentleman was actually a Glen Thorne player called Paddy Waters, who had come up from Dublin to play for Glen Thorne, but had also a, a trade as a brick buyer. And, and, and so it, it actually wasn't just builders. There were men of an evening coming out of the shipyard and helping to lay the outer perimeter wall. Uh, Players who were who were bricklaying and 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 even even children labouring to them, you know. So, so the whole stadium, you know, is, is built with the with the blood, sweat, and tears of of the local community, which which makes it all the more special, you know, the, the, what they achieved in that eight year period from a from a a water filled crater to uh, to what was at the time considered the best football stadium in Ireland. You know, remarkably, whatever had happened from the, the flood water and the bombing, it had made the playing surface absolutely incredible, you know. So 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 you go from being completely sort of wiped out to a point where you can accommodate upwards of forty thousand people when Benfica and Rangers come to the Oval in the sixties. That's incredible dedication from from a local community and and from uh, football fans. You know, no matter how much trouble they got in from their their wives and children for giving away their <laughs> uh, their ration coupons. Um, yeah. We'll we'll come back. You you mentioned there about people uh, pumping the the water out of the craters on the pitch, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. But. Want to say we we talked about the, the Tom Pearson Memorial and we briefly mentioned the observation post. Now that's another much more visible reminder of life during the Second World War at the Oval, and it's an item whose or uh, a, a structure whose post-war story is perhaps even richer than its wartime legacy. 
what can you tell us about, well, what's commonly known as the Glentoran pillbox? Yeah, the, the, the pillbox came about uh, yet again in 1940 when, when the, the Ministry of Defence approached Glentoran. Uh, as, as, as you know, Belfast was poorly defended uh, from, from any potential threat of, of, of bombing uh, with very few anti-aircraft batteries around the city. And uh, and the Ministry of Defence, I think we're, we're we're actually on on the lookout for for the highest ground in inner city East Belfast, and that exists uh, at the Sydenham end of 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 the Oval and uh, the football stadium, uh, that banked up as I say primarily to build the ground in the Velodrome in the nineteen tens, uh, but but. Before the days of advertising hoardings and mobile phone masts uh, during the war, uh, it provided an incredible view of not only the city but but also of the runway at, at, at Sydenham as it was at the time. Uh, it provided a view of the of the aircraft factory from from that hill. For example, you could see destroyers and battleships being being constructed. Uh, at Harlan and Wolf, so so the Ministry of Defence highlighted this as the perfect place for an observation post, and approached Glentorn in in 1940. Uh, Glentorn seeing an opportunity to rent the land, asked for a pound a week. Uh, that this this was renegotiated by the MOD to to a pound a year. So so uh, so 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 but you know. The Glens were never going to sort of rage against the fact that an observation post was needed and, and agreed for it to be built. So it was built in 1940 by the, the Royal Engineers uh, and, and occupied on a, on a daily basis. I'm led to believe there was a detachment of the Gloucestershire Regiment who were based in Victoria Park and also, I think, up at Campbell College. And it was they who manned or who were manning the post. Uh, on on both the Easter the Easter raids and also on the night of the fire raid as well. So uh, so incredibly, this 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 structure you know actually witnessed everything there was to see as regards the destruction of Belfast, and uh, and these, these poor, poor fellows were were left helpless in it on the night that the oval was destroyed. So it's. Uh, you know, it's it's always been significant. I think as, as kids, we never really knew what the building was for. You know, and it was uh, it had fallen into neglect, uh, in a real bad state of affairs. And about about four or five years ago, now I took it upon myself to actually contact the Royal Engineers again to see if they would be interested in in, in restoring it. And and they agreed to it in a heartbeat. And and we had an incredible few days. Where the guys came down, cleared all the weeds off it. They actually re sandbagged it. They, they put back the uh, the corrugated tin roofing inside it and, and replaced it. And it has become uh, we, we do tours of the oval for for what are known as ground hoppers, which is a real incredible movement of football supporters across Europe who who and, and brace yourself for this. See the oval as as one of these stadiums to see before you die. I think it's. I think it's. It's only. It's only superseded by uh, by the home of Boca Juniors in Argentina, the Bombonera. But uh, so, so we're inundated with maybe 15, 20, 30 people from all over Europe, Japan, the USA, who, who who come to the Oval week on week, and uh, and we do tours for them and and. One of the undoubted highlights is the visit to the the the, the, the pillbox, you know, because you, you you can go into it, you can you can stand in there and, and just imagine Belfast burning and, and the mayhem and carnage that, that ensued. So it's a, it's a very tangible asset, not only to Glenthorn Football Club, but in, in my opinion, the city of Belfast. You know, it would be it would be lovely to see it utilised more for you know kids in their their curriculum studying the Blitz in Belfast and things like that. You know, it's a, it is a very, very tangible reminder of a, you know, a terrible time. Uh, I I certainly would love to see it 
utilized more. And I know, I think a couple of years ago, I was involved with a a festival as part of the with with Eastside partnership, and uh, they they had done a couple of days up there. Um, of just you know, and it's it is like you say that spectacular views out of the shipyard and and the the former aircraft factory, the the uh, former RAF Sydenham. You've got the old railway line there. You've got the river. It's such a key you know strong point in in the city, and so many stories that can be be told from that. And uh, you know, just just the other day there, in fact, I uh, I shared a couple of photos on our uh, social media um, of that. Um, I think it was, it was either 7th or 9th Battalion of the Gloucestershire Regiment in Victoria Park. And they mm-hmm. um, they were visited and inspected on the 21st of April uh, 1941 by the Jacob Gloucester. Um, so he obviously uh, visiting what would kind of technically be one of his home home battalions um uh-huh. on the uh on what's now uh football fields in in victoria park so it's just it, it it was a real kind of moment to to watch those those men just standing there meeting a, a member of the royal family less than a week after uh the easter tuesday raid of the belfast splits and knowing that some of them could have been up on that bank at the oval you know man in the man in the observation post it's uh no no it's actually you know horrific to to, to imagine you know that I, I suppose they they themselves didn't know where the next bomb was falling and and to be billeted in victoria park as well you, you know that that and s- somewhere out there and I, I remember at the onset of the internet stumbling across an account by one of the soldiers uh and and it's it's one of my holy grails now one of the uh, it was an account of one of the, the soldiers who was actually in the pillbox uh, during one of the raids. Now I don't know whether it was the night that the over was bombed or, or one of the earlier, but but I hadn't the presence of mind at the time to actually, you know, make note of it or whatever. And for the life of me now, I I, I just can't find it again, you know. But uh, but no, it's it's a real. You you know more than anybody the the, the amount of sort of ex- existing or remaining artifacts like that you know which uh, and 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 look that you know that we we would encourage people you you know that when the stadium's open there, there's never any real issue with someone coming down and having to look around the the staff there are always really really friendly and keen to show people around you know so if you have an interest. Come, come down and take a look at it. You know, it's uh, it's definitely worth seeing. Well, I think you've you've definitely whetted the appetite there, and I think you know, we 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 have listeners here who obviously aren't aren't in and around East Belfast, so uh, maybe someday. Uh, I was going to say in the better weather, but it's actually quite it's it's nicer than I was yeah, expecting it to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, now now that the better weather's weather's coming in, uh, maybe we'll uh, join you for for a wee tour of the oval and we can bring the cameras down and uh show some show yeah, some please, folks around please do yeah you know it's only when you see the place and you realize the geography geography of it you know that you you can actually fully appreciate what it must have been like you know and and we have we have you know we're always on the sort of search for stories in and around the war and and, and whatever and uh we, we, we discovered yet again, maybe about twenty years ago, that there was actually a roof space in the new grandstand, and uh, and and something like a scene from from Tomb Raider. You know, we ended up clambering across the sort of the, and 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 amongst other things which had been stored in there were this incredible uh, raft of letters from from ex soldiers or soldiers who had been injured uh, during the war, who who had written to the club answering an advert for a night watchman uh, and uh, and some of them were actually heartbreaking you know that these these guys have come back with various injuries but were of good standing and you know for for one job as a night watchman at the oval during the rebuild during the last days of the war uh, obviously the other thing which you, you know building materials were coming down mercy street on a regular basis and you had bricks and girders and, and you know all all sorts of all sorts of material and the people of the locality 
obviously had had their homes destroyed during the blitz and you know anything that covered was coming in let's face it unless it was being watched it was, was going back out again to help these folk rebuild it you know so so one of the nice little things as i say was to build this perimeter wall and the employee night watchman so so we're in possession of the ladders too which are which are you know we've been clamoring for a museum forever you know for the club because there's so much history to it and uh it would be lovely to put artifacts like this on display as well i think it'd be be something that would be wonderful for you know every football club here uh to do because you know i'm sure those stories you know i know even as, as a Port Down fan i know that we had you know players come over from england like the you know equivalent to tom pearson you know who played top mm -hmm. league football yep. then been enlisted in the army find themselves in in northern ireland and you know there's an incredible kind of second world war heritage i imagine with every club but uh in in particular with with the glens and yeah i think uh, a museum or some sort of you know permanent uh permanent heritage site you know would be would be a great thing um yeah there's the you know, there's always been a like a military link, if you like, you know, through through the First World War in the nineteen twenties, the American the American Navy would would would, would come up the lock and, and, and destroyers and teams from what whatever ship was was in Belfast at the time would would actually come and play exhibition matches of baseball at the Oval. And with some amazing photographs, like in the in their full baseball uniforms, you know, with with the picture being the Lord Mayor of Belfast and whatever, you know, and the uh, the veterans of the Eighth Battalion, you, you know, from 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 the the, the First World War, uh, you know, they would have their colours presented at the Oval as well. So so there's always been that linkage, you know, and uh, it's it's something we're keen to sort of maintain and tell the story of as best we can. Now, um, despite us following different football teams we both have clearly a shared passion for all things second world war and very recently we had a, a lengthy chat about all sorts of things in the wonderful linen hall cafe and mm -hmm. it seems from that from what i remember of that conversation it seems that you've got to the bottom of something of a post-war mystery um so like like that um that kind of witness statement from from that soldier uh, that appeared once on the internet and now we are unable to find it uh, both online and in written accounts i have often seen mentions of photos of the oval after the blitz uh, for just as many years as that it seems that no one had seen these actual photos uh, they've become something of a myth and they showed creators in the in the ground filled with water and in those craters were swimming the swans from the Conswater River. Um, Sam, tell us about the swans. Is this real? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The swans, you know, the swans actually appear in in, in songs written about Glen Torren, uh, you know, the, and and the bombing of the ground. And uh, there's a, there's a brilliant local historian by the name of Bobby Cosgrove. And, and 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 speaking to Bobby, Bobby had always maintained that he had seen these photographs of of swans on the lake at the Oval. Uh, but but try as we might, uh, we we could never find them. We couldn't find them in any of the uh, any of the newspaper libraries. We couldn't find them in 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 your own library. And uh, and for the longest time, I think we'd given up the ghost. I'd written a book called There's a Green Sword called The Oval, uh, based on the lines from a song about Glen Thorne. And, and that's when I began to deep dive, you know, you know and, and try and find these, these photographs. And it didn't, it didn't come up with them then. What we did come up with were, were remarkable photographs of, of sheep grazing uh, on the pitch. In, in 1946, and it would appear from 1946 onwards that that farmers of the area would bring their sheep down D Street, along Mersey Street, and in whatever way they did it, and allow the sheep to graze on the pitch. And with a photograph of you know photograph of the sheep, uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons why the actual playing surface was so good too. We then discovered the the, the, the photograph of of, of the Glenthorne secretary during the war on a horse like a you know a shire horse almost 
which uh, which they must have used for moving stuff around the ground. But but yeah, the uh, the photographs remained elusive, and and we'd, we'd pretty much given up. They, they, they were actually known as the Holy Grail, and and numerous supporters tried their best to find them. Uh, and, and another great Glenthorne supporter by the name of Robert Childs, who's who's who, who, who's a historian uh, in the same fashion as I would be with Glen Thorne of Harland and Wolf, and and is a senior electrician. Robert Robert, for example, would you know either be fixing at, at Samson or Goliath or actually driving them, for example, you know. And and Robert's been a great help to us. And I think I think it was a couple of years ago, but but someone approached the you know the the, the the gate of the shipyard and and he was called down looking for robert and and robert had come to the gate to find the gentleman saying that he'd been clearing out his father's possessions and uh and he had found these photographs and, and would they be a fan of use to him and lo and behold in in this envelope were were press photographs they weren't even just amateur photographs they were they were press photographs taken uh seven or eight images which show the which show the stadium being pumped out by a Harlan and Wolf pump, believe it or not. And uh and remarkably in one of the photographs is a relative of Roberts in the photograph. And the chances of that being the case are absolutely incredible. So so from that we 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 now have this amazing series of images uh showing just how badly uh the, the the ground was affected you know and i suppose you know everything comes to he who waits and and uh and we use those in the tours now we was not wasn't blown up and people can come and examine the uh you can stand and see just how bad things were you know so 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 the achievement from 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 what it was to what it became and by 1953 this this fit for purpose stadium, you know, and, and the people who raised the money and, and who donated their clothing coupons and you know, is uh it's just absolutely incredible. And I think also the thing, you know, the thing which was the success of Glen Porn's food, football club was its vicinity to the shipyard and the thing which would become the the reason for the demise of Glen Thorne Football Club was its vicinity to the shipyard and the fact that the uh the Germans thought that it was part of it. Now, Sam, you are clearly as much of a history fan as a football fan. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you working on at the minute? And uh, where can our listeners keep up with you? Um, if they want to see some of those photos, if they want a tour of the ground, um, what's the best way to, to follow you and your work? Well, I would, I would suggest if you're if, if you're interested in a tour of the ground, the uh, the East Side Arts Festival, which which generally runs in July or August, uh, as as part of that, we put on two dedicated tours of the ground, uh, which which we we call it's back to the oval we go, which which yet again is a line from the song, uh, and and we put that on. It's about do you know what? It, it, it's meant to be in an hour and a half tour, but it generally runs to about two and a half, three, you, you, you know, because people have so many questions. And we, we generally with 20 people in the tour and and the feedback's absolutely beautiful on it. And I, I wouldn't be averse to actually running more tours if people were interested uh, and come to sell out almost instantaneously, you know. And it's look, it's not about the football, it's about the you, you, you know it's the stories of the people and uh and you really get to appreciate it when you when you come along so i'd encourage people to join us for that uh as regards myself uh we're we're, we're cur currently and, and you know because we've, we've worked together on this uh we're currently exploring the story of uh and, and many people have done it before but a, a really extensive telling of the tale of the uh the kinder farm at belly Rally house of Malay. Uh, and we're, 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 we're hoping to expand that story in, in the near future as well. Uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm also, uh, I've, I've written a play about the Vienna Cup, which is an, a, another story, uh, uh, completely aside to this one, which, which is called One Saturday Before the War, but it touches on the first World War in the club as well. So we've got a rerun of that coming up in July and August at the 
Sanctuary Theatre, which is 1A Castlereagh Ray Street. Uh, and if you go under the, the, the Bright Umbrella website, uh, you can see more details of that particular store. So not much happening. <laughs> Busy as always. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more about the uh the Bally Rolly in, in the Isle uh project. But uh you know what, Sam, for now, I think before we drag this on like a three hour tour of the Oval, <laughs> I think we should say thank you for joining us on a wee bit of war today. Thank you for taking us through the Belfast Blitz and for doing your part to remember the life and service of guardsman Thomas Pearson. Thank you. Scott, thanks a million. It's been an absolute delight, an absolute honour to be on. Thanks a million. Take care. Subscribe to A Wee Bit of War on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favourite shows. That way, you will never miss an episode. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your co-workers, break all the rules of the Official Secrets Act, and why not leave us a review to help others find the podcast. Thank you for joining myself and Sam Robinson. And I look forward to your company again next time for another wee bit of war.